Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, Pepperdine University School of Law for a very special occasion. My name is Tom Bost. I'm the interim dean of the School of Law. And on behalf of the school, I want to welcome you to, uh, to uh, this special event. Uh, Pepperdine's relationship with the country of Uganda has become a strong one and one that's very important to us. And we hope that it is helpful and, uh, to, to the country of Uganda. But it was pioneered, this relationship was pioneered through the Herbert and Eleanor Newtbar Institute on Law, Religion, and Ethics and the Institute's Global Justice Program. We are so delighted to have as special guests with us today, Herb and Eleanor Newtbar. Would you stand or at least wave, <laughs> let us recognize you? Now, Herb, I was not going to mention your age, but I was going to point out that at your birthday party in November, there'll be 102 ca candles on that birthday cake. Uh, we're so delighted that you came up to be with us today and to honor our guests, but with your presence. It's my distinct pleasure this afternoon to introduce you to a very distinguished guest of the, of the School of Law. We've had the pleasure of hosting him and his associates, Mr. Imacor and uh, Justice Kira Burai, who, by the way, is a frequent visitor to Pepperdine. Is this the fourth time? Third time, the third time for the justice. And we're so delighted that they came all the way from, uh, from uh, Kampala to be with us. They're with us this week in a week-long visit to our school and to our community and met uh, a number of prominent judicial and law enforcement uh, officials and have shared their wisdom with us. We, the faculty and staff and students, have been very excited about uh, this visit and we're glad to be able to introduce uh, our panel to you. But I want to take, uh, I want to make a special introduction of one member of the panel and that of course is Chief Justice Benjamin Adoki. Chief Justice Adoki is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Uganda. He was born in 1943 in eastern Uganda and then completed his secondary education at King's College Budo and received his Bachelor of Law degrees from the University of Dar es Salaam in 1969. From 1969 to 1978, Justice Adoki occupied several important legal, professional, and educational posts. In June 1978, shortly uh, about a year before the uh, overthrow of Idi Amin's regime in April of, 18, of 1979, Justice Adoki was appointed a judge of the High Court. In 1981, that is two years after the overthrow of the Amin regime, Chief Justice Adoki was appointed the Director of Public Prosecutions in the Ministry of Justice with a mandate to reorganize and rebuild the department to support efforts to restore the rule of law in this country. The rule of law never to be taken for granted and not at all taken for granted by the Ugandans. One of his assignments was to prosecute those persons who had committed atrocities during the regime of Idi Amin. He returned to the High Court in 1984 after accomplishing that task. Chief Justice Adoki was elevated to the Supreme Court in 1986. Three years later, he was appointed chairman of the Ugandan Constitutional Commission, the goal of which was to draft a new constitution for the country of Uganda a constitution based on the rule of law, not on personality, not on faction, but on the rule of law with equal justice to all. The, his leadership and contribution to this process is the subject of this very significant book by Justice Odoki, The Search for, Nation, for a National Consensus, The Making of the 1995 Uganda Constitution. He returned to the Supreme Court in 1993 after completing his assignment of, of uh, leading the drafting and adoption of the Constitution. 
And in 2001, February 2001, Chief Justice Odoki was appointed the Chief Justice of Uganda. He has presided over a number of constitutional appeals in the Supreme Court, which have had a significant impact on the promotion of democracy, constitutionalism, and the rule of law in the country. He's been consulted by several countries in structuring their constitutional review process, uh, including Kenya, Rwanda, South Africa, Swaziland. He's acted as a consultant to the government of Uganda, the World Bank, and the Commonwealth Secretariat on legal sector uh, reforms and on democracy and human rights. He's been the, a member of many commissions and committees. He chaired the Law Council, which is responsible for regulating and controlling the legal profession in the country of Uganda. He's a member of several national and international organizations as well, including the World Jurist Association, the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, the Southern African Judges Commission, the Judicial Group on Strengthening Judicial Integrity, and the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague. In addition to all of this, he has widely traveled and has presented, his paper, and presented papers at numerous conferences. He's a prolific writer and has published several books in addition to this groundbreaking book and many articles in local and international journals. He's received several awards in recognition of his contribution to the constitutional development, the legal profession, and the rule of law in Uganda. Please join me in welcoming Chief Justice Benjamin Odoki. This afternoon's program is uh, styled as a conversation with Chief Justice, Justice Odoki, and our conversationalists are L. Timothy Perrin, who is the Vice Dean of the School of Law, uh, Justice uh, uh, Jeffrey Kiribarai, who is, a, who is the, um, who is the a Justice of the High Court of Uganda, the Commercial Division, and by the way, have a brand new and beautiful and functional court, courthouse, and Nicole Hutchinson, who is a JD M, uh, Master of Public Policy candidate, who, was the two, who in 2009 was an extern for Justice Odoki. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Dean Perrin. Thank you, Dean Bost. It is such a thrill to be with you. Thank you all for coming today and for honoring us with your presence. We're very excited to, uh, to have Chief Justice Odoki and Justice uh, Kiri Abrire, who we affectionately call Justice K for reasons that are quite obvious. <laughs> but uh, it's been a great week, and we have enjoyed uh, deepening our friendship with uh, the Uganda judiciary. And I know that you're going to enjoy uh, what you're going to hear today, because uh, primarily because you're not going to hear from me, but uh, you're going to hear from uh, Chief Justice Sadoki and from Justice Kiri Abrire. The relationship between Pepperdine Law School and the Uganda judi judiciary is not that old but it has already, in a very short period of time, become an important part of the life of the law school. It started with students, as so many things at Pepperdine Law School do. In 2007, uh, two of our law students had the opportunity to go to Uganda to a judicial conference and uh, to meet Chief Justice Sadoki, among others. And out of that, uh, they ended up returning with another fellow student uh, that summer uh, to work for the courts in Uganda. And for the three summers following that, we've had uh, at least 10 students 10 Pepperdine Law students uh, who have gone to, uh, to Uganda during the summer to work for the judiciary. And Justice uh, Kiri Abrire has been the coordinator of that effort. We're so grateful for all that he's done to make it possible with the full support and encouragement of Chief Justice Sadoki. I've had the great uh, privilege to travel to uh, Uganda as well, making my first trip to Africa in July. And uh, I had the full Ugandan experience in every way. I rode the boat of Bodas. <laughs> uh, much to the chagrin of Chief Justice Adoki, and uh, those are motorcycle taxis that are, are life-risking endeavors, uh, to say the least. But they're very fast, they're very efficient, and uh, was thrilled to have, uh, to have the opportunities that I did to, to be there. One of the highlights of my time there was uh, the opportunity to meet uh, in chambers with Chief Justice Adoki, uh, and I really was so appreciative and grateful for his hospitality. I was there uh, with uh, my colleague, Dean Gash, and with our 10 Pepperdine Law students, we had a great opportunity to visit with him and ask him questions about his work uh, for the judiciary. But the highlight of that meeting was uh, to get a commitment from him that he was going to make this trip 
to Pepperdine that we had so mm -hmm. much wanted and longed for, and uh, we were able to confirm it. And so it's a, an even greater thrill to actually have uh, seen it come to fruition and have a chance to engage in this conversation. And Justice, uh, Chief Justice Adoki is truly the father of the Ugandan Constitution, and we have a unique opportunity today uh, to hear from him, as well as Justice Kerry Breary. Uh, as is our tradition in these events, we like to have conversations instead of lectures. Uh, it allows for a, a more dynamic uh, interchange between the audience and, uh, and our uh, distinguished guest. And so I'm going to encourage you, uh, if, if the uh, spirit leads you to do so, uh, to take one of those uh, note cards that are in front of you and to write a question or more, or more than one question and uh, pass it to the end of the aisle and uh, we'll have some folks uh, come around periodically and pick those up. And we will try to get to as many of those questions as we can. We want to uh, we want to ask the questions that you would like uh, to ask. And uh, Chief Justice Adoki has said, I will answer anything. Is that a quote? <laughs> <laughs> As Dean Bost has already said, uh, uh, Chief Justice Adoki's work on drafting the Constitution is really uh, quite remarkable. In this book that, I, that he's already held up, I encourage you to read. I read it on the plane back from uh, Kampala and uh, found it to be quite a page turner. It's, uh, it's a fascinating story about the challenges that were overcome uh, to make this 1995 Constitution happen. It seems appropriate that we have uh, Chief Justice Adoki with us today in as much as last Friday, September 17th, was Constitution Day in the United States as we celebrated uh, our own constitutional order and uh, that grand document that uh, Chief Justice Adoki uh, gives high praise to in his book as well. And so I want to start with a couple of questions about uh, uh, Chief Justice Sadoki's leadership of the Constitutional Commission and his efforts in that regard. And I love this quote, Chief Justice Sadoki, from, from your book. I can even give you the specific citation if you want it. Uh, but you say this, the challenge that faced Ugandans in making a new constitution was to forget and forgive the past, learn from their past mistakes, embrace democratic values of tolerance of diverse views, Cultivate the spirit of give and take and compromise and acceptance of majority views while respecting the views of the minority and agree to make a fresh start. And I wonder, in light of the challenges that you face, that's quite, uh, that's quite a list of challenges, if you would begin by describing uh, the process of, of uh, drafting a constitution and how you faced and, and dealt with the challenges that were before you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Dean and uh, <clears throat> first of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to interact with the, the university community and particularly the, the law students, uh, uh, members of the faculty of law. Uh, I, I don't like talking very much about what I did. Uh, in fact, this book was uh, like a, a process of uh, um, um, accommodating those who wanted me to write the book, because I didn't want to write the book. I had, <laughs> delivered, I had delivered the constitution, and there was, no need, nothing, there was nothing more to explain. <laughs> when a judge writes a judgment, he doesn't go to the public explaining why he reached that decision. We never do it. However, I have now done it. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was a daunting task. Here is a country which has gone, had gone through a lot of problems. Uh, political and constitutional stability from independence uh, until 86 and, uh, and beyond. Changing government by the gun, destruction of the economy, destruction of some traditional institutions, uh, lack of respect for the human rights and rule of law, Uh, even lost respect internationally. This is the country we're supposed to rebuild, to reconstitute, to give a fresh start. A country of diversity, over 50 ethnic groups, and maybe equivalent languages. A country with diverse political systems, centralized, centralized system with the kings and uh, uh, and, and traditional rulers and other systems which are fragmented, which never had chiefs, but only elders. We had to contain all these diversities, all these nationalities, 
all these people with different religions and faiths who had different interests and who had different expectations, mm. but who actually had no time to but to live as Ugandans. So they had to decide how they go to live together. And who, are, who was me to try and tell them how they should live with, with each other? Who am I? <laughs> I was a simple judge, not a politician. One of the reasons what, why I did not want to, the, to do this job was because I was not a politician. And they said, for that reason, you have no vested interests. You are the right person. You will be impartial. Anyway, one historian has said that one of the greatest problems with Ugandans was the lack of compromise. They will never compromise. And Uganda had been declared ungovernable. That's why a lot of military rulers are running the country. So we had to develop a system in which people participate. A government by consent of the government. A government which respects uh, uh, human rights and rule of law. A government which is limited in power, not an absolute government. A government which respects international obligations. And though the people had to talk, <laughs> this conversation had to continue until we agreed. How do you want to live together? That was my job, steering this process of this conversation. Not coercing minds, persuading, guiding, persuading, explaining, giving options, recording the past to inform the present and the future. Mm. This book was launched by the Chief Justice of South Africa, the former Chief Justice, Arthur Charles Casson. He's now retired. He was the President of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. He disagreed with my statement that we should forget and forgive. For South Africa, he said, we shall not forget, but shall forgive. Mm. Well, well, I don't know. You have said, that's what I said. Yes, that's what I said. I said, let us forget and forgive. And, and I meant precisely that. Uh, and so the whole process was intended to really to enable people to discuss with each other. And we're exhorting them to, to listen to each other. To have tolerance. Peace cannot be created without tolerance. The majority cannot rule without minority. They're all part of society. <laughs> and so, we had to, the consensus means, consensus means general agreement. A minimum general agreement for the whole country. Very complicated process. Mm. But there's no way you can run a country unless you have a, good, a similar foundation, a strong foundation on which you are all agreed. Because the Constitution, after all, what is the Constitution? It's a power map, a charter of government. It is, it is both political and legal document. It's a supreme law of the, of the country, but at the same time, it's a social contract. And that contract, people make that contract with their government and with each other. So that basically was the, the challenge. So how did you go about developing, uh, learning, and uh, uh, ascertaining the national consensus? And that was a very difficult and labor-intensive process. You actually went to the people. First of all, we had to enlighten the people. People asked us, what are you talking about? We have never seen a constitution, not in this country. We have never seen one. Not only that, we don't know what it contains. So how can I help you to review the constitution and make proposals? 
So why did you get the paper about the Constitution? What does it contain? What does it serve? How important is it to a country? We had to build confidence in the people. The Constitution had been thrown in the dustbin by, by, by governments. Every mm -hmm. government which came, we had about 10 governments by the time I wrote the Constitution. Some lasting 60 days, other six months. They asked us, who will safeguard this Constitution? Which you ask, were asking us to help in preparation. What are, the, what are the issues you want us to discuss? And what will happen if we disagree? What will happen if you don't take into account our views and you write your own things for the government which has appointed you? We have to make sure that we became legitimate, we became credible, to be able to collect the views. After we have inter gone around the whole country, village to village, we told them to pay their views in the writing or orally. We will come back and collect them. Those who cannot write, we shall listen to them. So we went back again, second round. <laughs> have you written your views? Have you not written? Tell us if you have not, why you have not written, and we will listen to you. We recorded all the views. After we collected the views, that was the main problem. We got over 25,000 documents <laughs> from the people, the leaders themselves, the institution, interest groups, the lawyers, the, law, the universities, the, the women, the military, all types of people submitted the memoranda. The type of constitution they wanted. We had to analyze those views. Issue by issue. Do you want federalism or unitary system of government? Should the president be directly elected? We even asked, should the death penalty be abolished? <laughs> but it became very controversial. So all the issues were analyzed. There were over 20 issues which were analyzed. And so we got the preponderance. We got the, how did the people, what, what, how did the people respond? On, some, on most of the issues, there was consensus. They wanted a direct elected president, not uh, somebody picked by a few people. They wanted the republicanism, that the, nobody, should, nobody was not elected to run the government. They rejected the federalism, that our country, the country is too small and it's too expensive to run federal. So they wanted decentralized power and give it to local government. They wanted, they wanted a strong parliament, which is not uh, 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 controlled by the presidency. And so parliament was made independent. Mm. The president has no power to dissolve parliament. The president is not a member of parliament. And parliament must approve all political appointments, including those of the chief justice, ministers, Judges, ambassadors. Parliament must approve war, must approve uh, loans of, of, of government, and so on. They wanted an independent judiciary, independent and effective. Not a, a judiciary which is the, we, 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 which is uh, subservient to the executive or the oil parliament. And so the independence of the judiciary was guaranteed the constitution. All these issues, there were general consensus. There was no debate about it. They agreed. We need a strong judiciary. Uh, justice must be accessible. It 
Who are the people of Uganda? Uh, they wanted a strong Bill of Rights, very strong, with no rights, with no clawbacks on the clauses. <laughs> that, that rights could be derogated in terms of national security, public order, and so on. So no. They cannot be derogated from only in as far as justifiable in the free and democratic society. To derogate from all those rights, it must be justifiable in a free and democratic society. That's the formula. Certain rights are not derogatable. You have your scopus, right to fair trial, fair, right to fair trial and, and the right against torture. I mean, you could not, they, those are not derogatable. You cannot, you cannot qualify them, you cannot suspend them. Mm. They wanted rights of marginalized groups to be uh, guaranteed. Women in those days, in the, they, were, they were classified as disadvantaged groups. Disadvantaged by history and custom. The rights were, 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 were highlighted in the Constitution. And they were given affirmative action to reduce the jail in, injustice caused by, by custom mm. and so on. Rights of other marginalized groups or disadvantaged groups like the disabled, past people with disability, children, the aged, the youth. youth yeah, the ch youth are children. Widows. Mm. We have a lot of widows because of wars. Mm. All those rights were guaranteed in the Constitution. So the Constitution is a modern bill of rights. It has got both the political and civil, social and economic, and and these and these third generation rights like a right to development, right to environment, health environment, all the rights are there. And there was we established a human rights commission to ensure that human rights are observed in the country. And that the country, and the government itself observes human rights. It monitors compliance with international uh, conventions and makes a report to government. And that it can visit jails and release persons who are who are, who are illegally detained in those detention centers. And that can award damages for people who come to the commission and say my rights have been violated, I've been tortured. I was not even paid my salary by my, my boss, who is a big man. <laughs> and the courts are not accessible to me. So the human rights has got a tribunal to award damages <laughs> quickly. Uh, and so the courts are there to enforce human rights. And anybody, and any group of persons can bring an action to protect the rights of another person. It doesn't have to have an interest in the matter. Any group of persons, when they feel that somebody has been, and most of the, for instance, uh, a lot of groups have brought actions to protect the rights of women. In relation to divorce, discriminatory grounds of divorce were struck down because women, men were having a, a field day, they had two grounds, a woman, you had, the woman has to, fit, to, to prove two grounds of divorce, maybe cruelty and desertion, and the man only one ground. <laughs> that was struck down as unconstitutional. A number of other uh, areas uh, relating to women, um, uh, like uh, 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 recently they struck down uh, female genital mutilation as unconstitutional. Uh, and so on and so on. But there are other areas. Law Society of Uganda brought action to defend the independence of the Constitution. Mm. When the security, organ, security, security people agents entered the High Court to release somebody who had been, to arrest somebody who had been released, given freedom by the court, and seized, him, seized them and took them back to prison, the court, court held that was an affront on the independence of the judiciary. It was not acceptable. So on and so on and so on and so on. So all these groups have brought actions. For instance, they've ruled against corporal punishment. That is, uh, I don't know about corporal punishment here, <laughs> but it's, it's, un, it's unconstitutional in Uganda. The courts have ruled so. So these groups, they've brought actions in relation to environment, uh, smoking in public and so on. <laughs> I don't know about here. So anyway, the, the, the Bill of Rights is there. Uh, it is there to protect the people. And human rights uh, observance has uh, relatively increased. And, 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 and lastly, let me just deal about issues of governance. Uh, corruption is rampant 
in some of in many, many African countries. So the issues of good governance, the issues of accountability of leaders, uh, were very high on the agenda for constitutional making. Mm. Now, all these issues, there was agreement that corruption must be fought among leaders. So we have a leadership code. I have to declare what I own and what I don't own. Assets and liabilities every two years must be declared to government. All judges, all ministers, all members of parliament, all leaders, senior public officers, they must declare their assets every year. And they are monitored. The idea is to ensure that you don't amass wealth more than beyond what, what is your reasonable um, income. Conflict of interest. All these issues are dealt in the leadership code. And Inspector General of Government, who is the Ombudsman, is mandated to fight corruption, to educate the public against the vice of corruption and to arrest and prosecute all corrupt people. The Ombudsman has a right to arrest and prosecute any corrupt person. It has got a very strong powers. Mm. Arrested ministers, former ministers were arrested. I think two of them are facing corruption charges. They stole money belonging to Global Fund. Global Fund was a fund to, to help people in, in uh, I think, malaria, and, and I think HIV, tuberculosis. Mm. But money was stolen in that ministry. Uh, so they're facing charges on that. Uh, I think I should, I should stop there because uh, I have a consensus, there were issues of consensus where we found that uh, uh, they could not be resolved uh, successfully and those were shelved. Uh, and so uh, I think that uh, uh, subsequently they were resolved actually like a multi-party. became very controversial, but has now been resolved in Uganda as a multi-party state, yes. Mm. Thank you, Chief Justice Adoki. I, I wonder, Justice Kiryabire, if you would be willing to share a little bit about your perspective of the process. I mean, you were, I don't know what, a young lawyer at the time <laughs> when this was happening? <laughs> very young lawyer at the time, perhaps? Uh, and, and how it felt uh, as this new constitution, the process of developing and uh, putting in place this new constitution. Uh, thank you, uh, Dean Perrin, and it's really good to be back at Pepperdine, uh, see old friends, uh, meet new friends, and uh, be able to come with the Chief Justice this time around. It's, uh, uh, thank you for the invitation. I think the Chief Justice has given you the very best overview of how that process came together. I can only say that uh, as a young person during the, <laughs> during the time of Idi Amin, I was in primary school uh, uh, when he took power. And, uh, there, there was a lot of, uh, the feeling was bad. The, the, the whole question of rule of law uh, was problematic. Uh, many of us as young people uh, who had parents at the time were in influential positions. It was not unlikely that you'd come home and uh, you'd be told that uh, your parent had disappeared. Uh, disappeared was another acronym in Uganda for had been killed or mm. taken out. There, there are very many people in Uganda who uh, came home and uh, they, they never saw their parents again, and never found them, never were able to give a decent burial to, to, to their parents. I, I recall one instance when my, my own father was a doctor. Uh, early in the morning, uh, the security agencies were, were going next door and uh, uh, trying to intervene in a situation I could never understand up to today what that intervention was all about. But the lady in that house ran to our house and asked my father to go and help. And my father had just got out of the bathroom and he had his bathrobe on <laughs> and uh, 
They said, come and help, come and help. There's a situation. So uh, he went and tried to help and resolve that situation. And within a split second, the whole of the capital city knew that, because they saw him being walked by security agencies, they knew that he, had, he was taken and he was not going to come back. That's the kind of background mm. that I can tell you uh, was happening in the country. I can also say that many, many of us who were growing at the time, uh, when we finished school, when we finished school, we knew that the one and only thing you needed to do was to get out of Uganda. Mm. Because if you wanted to live in Uganda, you would die young. And this was simply because we saw many adults die. And so we knew that there was no rule of law, there was no stability of government, uh, no respect for human rights. And so when the current government came into power, everybody was looking at them to see if they would make a change. Mm. In, in Uganda, we call it not just change, but a fundamental change. Mm. And this process, which the Chief Justice has just outlined, was something that drew a lot of confidence in, in the population. Uh, I can say that uh, looking at those stepping stones taking place, it was possible for young professionals like me to remain in Uganda with some sense of hope uh, that we could remain and make a contribution in the country. And so we, we view uh, this constitution-making process as a very important milestone in the recovery uh, of Uganda. And I can say uh, right now that a lot of people of my generation are now moving into leadership mm -hmm. positions. This is something that we had never anticipated. Uh, I, I never anticipated being a judge, being a young mm -hmm. man. Uh, but because of this constitution, we're able to go through a process which allowed me to become a judge. And uh, not only be a judge, but a judge whose judgments are respected. Uh, and therefore, in that way, in one way or another, help society resolve itself. Because if society does not resolve itself and more conflict takes place, then you're going to recede back to the old days. And this is something that would not want to happen. So I think that's the best way I can, yes. I can explain that. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. What, what, a, what a remarkable experience. I could not possibly have a better co-questioner than Nicole Hutchinson, who uh, was the first uh, Pepperdine Law student to have the opportunity to, uh, to work for the Chief Justice uh, during the summer of 2009. Yep. And uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Nicole for a couple of questions. All right. Um, thank you both for being here. And uh, I guess you asked the question in your thing, who am I to draft the Constitution? And uh, some of our audience is maybe not familiar with your legal career and your various accomplishments. So. We were hoping that after hearing about your work on the Ugandan Constitution, you could maybe talk about your legal career and how it did give you the opportunity to be able to draft the Constitution and then later to become Chief Justice. <laughs> um, how are leaders made, anyway? I mean, uh, what, that's mm. the question. How are leaders made? Mm. I'm not going to quote the Bible because uh, I'm not very good at quoting the Bible. <laughs> you will say God makes leaders, all authority comes from God, and so on. But uh, some people, I think, have advantage of others. I had advantage of a good, a good education. My father was a simple nurse in a hospital. Those who started hospitals in the early 30s when the British came to Uganda, and at that time, you could call they were the elites of the, of the time. Uh, but he was basically a poor person. But they went to good schools. He was very um, um, alert about the need to educate children. He had worked with the British and so on. So he took us to good schools. Um, um, I went to the same school as uh, <laughs> the professor said, which means <laughs> you can see it was a very good school, one of the best schools in the mm. country. And from there, I went to the, um, uh, the university, the only university in East Africa at that time. Uh, 20 students from Uganda, 20 from Kenya, 
20 from Tanzania. You had to be among the, first, the 20 students in the country to go to that university. And there was no other university in East Africa. And so I had the benefit of having a good education, I think, by the grace of God. Uh, I was a good student. You wouldn't go to do law unless, you, even up to now, you have to be a very bright student to do law. Um, I came out with the idea of going to teaching, uh, but for other reasons, uh, which I will not mention here, um, I was asked to go, to go and uh, start working. So I worked to go to went to the ministry straight, and uh, in that ministry, I moved up very fast. Uh, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Within the first year, I was posted to run a region, a district attorney for a whole region, Eastern Uganda. A young man, first year from university. Well, after, one year after university, I'm running the whole region. Uganda has got four regions. <laughs> <laughs> district attorney <laughs> for the whole region. Okay, I did so. And uh, the coup over men found me there. Actually, I mean, was overthrown when I was having a walk. Uh, I'd gone to walk to a school. I used to have a walk in the evening. And there was a British, a British headmaster there. The school where I went to was the school where I'm seven went to. This school where I was having a walk in Tare. Uh, the president was, had gone to that school. So he told me, what are you doing here, young man? The government has been overthrown. So I had to run home. <laughs> 1971. So things became difficult during my ministry time. My brother-in-law was killed in, in that area where mm -hmm. I was, and I was told, take back your sister. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in the army. Uh, so in 1972, I was called to Uganda, uh, to Kampala, to come and start the bar course. At that time, we wanted all the students who had done law to go and, 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 and do a legal practice course. The system had changed that people age was no longer very uh, effective. It was not uniform. People did acquire different uh, experience. So I was asked to come and uh, help starting that course. Now, I had not taught before to write a syllabus and start training lawyers from the university in the legal practice. That is a challenge. <laughs> Tell that me about is, it. It's a big challenge. <laughs> I, 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 dropped this, I drafted the criminal proceedings, civil proceedings, commercial transactions. Uh, we coined a few things and we were able to start the course. This course is now rated to be very difficult to pass. <laughs> yeah, it's very, uh, the, rate, the, the rate of, I think the, 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 the rate of failure is about 80%. Mm. So anyway, it is a difficult course. But we, we, we put it a bit too high at that time because students were asking me, what else can you teach us? We've got LLB, honors, first class, upper, second, and so on. So, Do you know practice? Can you draft a, a plaint? <laughs> can you draft a petition for divorce? Can you draft an application for injection? Then, can you draft a memorandum of association? They, they, they were, then they, they knew there they was something to learn. <laughs> they had done company law, but they could not draft. Maybe they have seen one. So, we'd, we'd, so that was the first challenge, if you like. To do something you've never done before. And uh, it took me only two years then, and I was appointed to head that law school. Only two years only. 72 by 75 was the, the director of that institution. So you can say I moved very fast. <laughs> <laughs> and I was there for four years, I mean for six years, two years teaching, and, four, and another four years as a director. And in 78, another four years, I was only high, uh, taken to the high court as a high court judge. So you can see uh, either, okay, I know, I know myself why, why, why I moved so fast. First of all, I was very devoted, mm. very committed, and highly principled. I taught many people who are now ministers and judges. Some were in the Supreme Court with me. I was a young man. But they had a lot of values. You know, we grew up in the Christian families, I mean, those of us, and the border was a Christian school. We had values. How to mold students. And a difficult time, during a minute's time. 
Very difficult. And during all this time I was working, I was being seen. People saw my work. I was able to relate to other leaders. And that's why I was picked out. I was just announced that I would not have been appointed a judge. And once it is announced by Ida Min, what else can you do? You already, you already, you, you have to comply. So anyway, uh, I think that uh, I had the opportunity to, to serve in key positions where your good work can be seen. And when I went to the High Court, uh, I did, I did, I wrote good judgments. I was told by students. <laughs> Uh, because I'd been teaching, so I wrote good students, uh, good lecture, good judgments, which were, they were said to be for students. Detailed, analytical, and so on. Uh, but then I was surprised after that, because uh, uh, when I mean I was overthrown, a new government was formed. And as you have heard, they required to restructure, to reorganize <laughs> institutions. And I was asked to go and run the to put together the Department of Public Prosecutions, which is a very important institution. Um, uh, contrary to my wishes. So I did a good job there. I restructured the institution. I left the institution and came back to small court. Now, when you are doing all these things, for instance, when I directed public prosecutions, I had access to the president. When you are Attorney General of a country, you have access to the highest authority. If they want to prosecute a minister, or if they want to prosecute somebody, a head of a, 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 a company or a public body, you have to talk to the president. <laughs> or a, a, a permanent secretary, or a chief of police. If you want to order his arrest, you have to talk to the, the minister. I mean the president. So I had access to all these people, the president, the Attorney General, all the other ministers. Uh, and uh, I suspect that uh, uh, that ha having, taking an early start in having responsible positions, uh, you can say, propelled me, propelled me to rise very fast. And I had versatile experience in you know, teaching, prostitution, judging, administration. So I had versatile situation, I mean, um, skills. And, and so when uh, Museven was appointed, uh, took over power, I was among the first judges who were promoted. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know how, why he was promoted, but maybe there was nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Museven took power in January and in, in February I was promoted. So I don't know. Um, I don't know what happened. And the, if, if you look, if you study history, if I was the director of prosecutions during the time, Museven went to the bush, the president, 81. And he was in the bush fighting. And I was supposed to prostitute people who were committing prison against the government. And here's the man who, whose people I was prostituting. He comes back and uh, promotes me. Mm. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Mm. But I was fair. Mm. I was a fair DPP. If you don't have a case, you don't have a case. If you have a case, you will go to court. So I think it was fair. And, uh, and uh, when they wanted somebody to do the court, they were not, a lot of appointments were made, but they were rejected. They said they wanted a judge. Former attorney generals, former lawyer, lawyers, and so on. They said they wanted a judge. And I don't know why they picked me anyway. I don't know. Uh, but uh, they picked me. Uh, but I think I had. I had, been, oh, I had been known by some, most of these people because I had trained many lawyers and I had worked with many lawyers and a lot of politicians are lawyers. <laughs> they know the good judges. It's true in this country too. So they know the good professors, <laughs> those whom we have taught. They know. So if they need a job, if they need somebody, they will do it. So I think that uh, it's a mixture of my, my education, my bring, bringing, the diversity of my experience, my interpersonal relations with others, uh, my commitment, my patriotism. I never left the country, despite uh, I could have left the country. My brothers left the country, they're still abroad. Mm. Yes. Uh, and, and so I'm still in the country. Yes. Uh, and uh, fate has made it that I'm now the Chief Justice. <laughs> I don't know why I was picked as Chief Justice. 
But the footnote is that, in actual fact, I was the most senior judge on the bench at that time. Mm. But also, person with maybe with varied experience, maybe with management skills, with a bit of a reformer, social, legal, mm. and so on. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I guess I'm going to change the topic a little bit because I know over the past few days you've had the opportunity to join us here at Pepperdine and kind of see what classes are like here and um, what U.S. legal education is like. And so we were wondering, since you've been a teacher and you mentioned that, if you could maybe reflect on what legal education in Uganda is like, how it um, differs, and uh, maybe what challenges you see facing Ugandan legal education. <laughs> Nicole, I think, has a bit of... I wrote, uh, I, I, I authored a World Bank report on the education in Uganda in 1995, uh, uh, where I reflected on uh, legal education in the country, uh, legal, and, and legal education training and accreditation in the country. And, uh, um, and uh, we reviewed the legal education, the, the quality, the access, and so on. We made drastic recommendations which increased the LLB degree from three years to four years and provided for a broad-based uh, syllabus to be able to enable lawyers to understand uh, the interlinkage between society and the law. Um, we also made subjects like constitutional law uh, and human rights compulsory. There were some core subjects which we thought were important to society, and so those were made compulsory. Uh, so that report is there. We recommended, uh, uh, among other things, the restructuring or the reform of the legal profession also to accommodate lawyers of practicing the, who have practiced the common law jurisdictions uh, and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, we did not recommend uh, that law should be a graduate course for obvious reasons, uh, costs basically. We're still fighting poverty in Uganda and in, in Africa. And uh, to require that uh, people who want to follow a profession should have a first degree first would have made have a cost on the, on the, on the, on the students. So the, on the compromise was to make it four years to be able them to grow up and uh, be uh, good lawyers. Uh, challenges facing the legal profession? Yes. I was a member of University Council um, yeah, in Makerere uh, for quite some time. And we introduced what I called private Law was, was funded by public previously, but we have introduced private courses uh, in law. So the numbers have increased. There's challenges of large numbers of students and lack of resources. Library, lecturers, the lecturer uh, student ratio is, is not very uh, favorable, the lack of books. Um, also poor quality of index because everybody now can do law, and that has a bad, a bad effect on the, on, the, on the quality of the products. Uh, and so there are those challenges. The cost is very high, uh, the cost is very expensive, uh, and so forth. Mm. Um, and I understand the products uh, which come out of the university are not as good as uh, previously. Justice Kiri Abrire, if I could uh, turn to you again. I know one of your passions is mediation, and uh, one of the questions, we've got great questions, uh, uh, and I wanted to ask you a question related to, uh, to your role in uh, helping to introduce and uh, expand the use of mediation. Uh, Justice Kiri Abrire sits on the commercial court, uh, the, the high court commercial division uh, in, in Uganda, and has, been, uh, has uh, done some training at Strauss. We're very proud of our Strauss Institute. And, uh, uh, and uh, has been very active in that area. So it'd be interesting you talking about uh, the development of mediation in, uh, in uh, resolution of civil disputes in Uganda and uh, what the future holds. Uh, mediation is, uh, or let me say, alternative dispute resolution. It's not one of those areas that we went uh, when we were doing uh, law that we were taught. Uh, we, we, we were taught to be gladiators. Uh, we, we took no prisoners. And uh, the way it worked is that the other person, you either won or the other person lost. That, that was the, 
the only way you could do legal practice. Uh, however, uh, in my professional life, uh, before I went to the, uh, to the bench, I was in business. Uh, I was in the financial sector. And I had a, a very interesting experience of both being an attorney and a businessman mm. at the same time. And it didn't take long for, for me to, to realize that uh, something was not working. Something was not working, and um, I was in the financial area, in particular banking and insurance, uh, specifically insurance, and that's, that generates a lot of conflict. And just talking about my own experience with uh, this process that I'm going to talk to you about, uh, in 1994, uh, a decision was taken to look at the, uh, the justice system, civil justice system in Uganda. And uh, a renowned uh, Ugandan judge, Justice Platt, was asked to put together a report. It was known as the Justice Platt uh, Commission of Inquiry Report. And I had the, the privilege to, to represent uh, the financial sector mm. at making a presentation to this distinguished panel. And I recall that one of the uh, presentations that we made is that uh, we needed to improve the way disputes from the business world were resolved in the justice system. And one of the recommendations that we made was that alternative dispute resolution should be seriously considered. And this is well documented in the Platt Report. But also, at the time, a lot of change was taking place in what, was the, what, what is the common law, the common law jurisdiction. Uh, there was a, a new thinking that was coming uh, out at this time. Or well, one of the other recommendations that we made is the creation of a commercial court, a commercial division of the high court. Uh, I didn't know I was working myself into a job at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but <clears throat> also in, 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 in England, the Wolf reform were taking place. Lord Wolf, uh, Chief Justice of England, he was also running a fairly similar mm. Uh, report at the same time. And the Lord Wolf reforms, as they later on got to be known, uh, did bring up these two things, these areas of reform. One, that within the judicial process, alternative dispute resolution should be considered. And also, that uh, in a way to improve efficiency within the justice system, that specialized divisions of the uh, of the courts should be set up. So our thinking in Uganda and in England, interestingly, was about the same, around the same time. But what was very fortunate for the Ugandan experience is that uh, Uganda moved very quickly into these reforms. By 1996, the commercial, div uh, well, it was not then a commercial division, it was more like uh, a commercial list at the time, was set up by mm. instrument mm. in Uganda, which led eventually to the creation of the commercial division of the high court. And very interestingly, for, for the first time, that instrument said that in resolving disputes that come before the commercial court, due consideration should be made to the use of alternative dispute resolution. Mm. That was a landmark uh, uh, instrument in terms of reforming the judicial process in Uganda. However, putting it together took a little longer. <laughs> putting it together took uh, a little longer. And at the time when I joined the judiciary uh, in 2003, this was now actually starting to come together. Mm. And in 2003, a pilot project was, was set up uh, in the commercial division of the high court. And the way it worked was simply like this, that when someone filed an, 
a, an action in the court, uh, it would normally take between 90 and 120 days before it could reach a docket of any judge because the judges were very busy. They, we, we suffer from, from backlog. That, that is the, the worst disease in any judicial system. You know? <laughs> uh, there's backlog all over the world. You know? it's, it's a cancer. It's a, it's a, big, mm. it's a big problem. Uh, what happened is within this window period, that action would be rerouted before a mediator. The reason for this was that if it wasn't, it would just sit there until it would go to the judge. But if it went before the mediator, several things could happen. One, it could be resolved, in which case it didn't have to go to, to, to the judge, or part of it could be resolved, and that part wouldn't go to the judge, and what remained of it would go to the judge, or it would not be resolved, in which case it would go to the judge anyway. And so we had a pilot project between 2003 and 2005. Uh, we, we had a lot of trouble because uh, there was a resistance, uh, likely as a result of uh, attitude and training of lawyers. Uh, normally, and I can speak like from my corporate background, if uh, a, a good corporate gives you uh, a case to take to court and you go back to the CEO and say, uh, look, I want you to come over and we discuss this before a mediator, the first thing that CEO will say, I thought you told me you had a good case. <laughs> Are you telling me that you fear you're going to lose this case? Uh, and so we had to deal with that. Uh, we had to deal with that. Uh, actually, one lawyer, one lawyer actually threatened to take uh, this matter to the Constitutional Court. You know, Justice Odoki has been, Chief Justice Odoki has been telling you about uh, the, the return to the rule of law. So now, going to the Constitutional case, I mean, Constitutional Court is something that happens very frequently for, for, for any reason in Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it to the Constitutional Court. So. Uh, but that one didn't happen. But uh, we, we, we got a success rate of about 22.1%. And that meant that 22.1% of all actions that were filed didn't come to, to us, the judges. And that was a great relief. <laughs> that was a great relief. Uh, just to give you a sense of how, how it works back home, in the commercial division, we are four judges for the whole country. I'm one of them. Uh, at the high court level, we're supposed, we're about 48 judges for the whole country. I was in Ventura, we met a friend recently, and they were shocked at these figures <laughs> because the population is about uh, the size of California. Yeah. But now we have rolled it out. We, we have gone through the test process, and now uh, court annex mediation is, 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 is accepted. Uh, people know that when you file an action uh, in, in the courts, uh, you are able to uh, first go before a mediator before you can go to a judge. And this is helping improve our efficiency within the court system and our effectiveness. Uh, we have also been very privileged in trying to develop this process to, be, to have worked with Pepperdine. Uh, you may know that... Uh, a graduate student from, from Pepperdine, um, uh, Mr. John Napier, was uh, at our court for the last one year. Uh, we've been taking externs during the summer, but John was with us for one year during, uh, uh, from about August last year to August this year. And the way the court next mediation program works is that we use judicial officers but we're very few, as I have said. Uh, normally registrars like, uh, like Samuel over there, but uh, we don't really have many of those also. So John Napier, and this is great credit to the uh, relationship between uh, Uganda and Pepperdine School of Law, John Napier became the first non-judicial officer who is accredited mm. to be a, a court-accredited mediator. Mm. 
So he, he was the first in, in, in Uganda. So he, he opened that way. And he, uh, together with another uh, lawyer who came to join him from South Africa, have been able <coughs> to train uh, another 20. Uh, <coughs> so as we are speaking now, we're going next month to roll out nine of those 20 to be court accredited mediators. So right now our statistics are growing. We're now in the 45% bracket. So we're very happy uh, that uh, mediation is now starting to take root in Uganda. John uh, was, a, uh, was a Newt Bar fellow uh, in Uganda. And uh, again, uh, we're so thrilled that the Newt Bars are here, but he uh, proudly uh, worked under the banner of the Newt Bar Institute, uh, spending a year in, uh, in Uganda. There's nothing quite like seeing uh, John Napier in his element in Kampala. He had a great, he had a great time. Another, uh, another question from the uh, audience uh, for you, Chief Justice Sadoki, says, I understand that Uganda's motto is for God and for country. To what extent did your religious beliefs influence <laughs> your drafting of Uganda's constitution and do your religious beliefs affect your decision making as a judge? Uh, the motto for God and my country was uh, coined or agreed upon at independence. And so it is our independence motto. But uh, the idea of, of retaining it uh, was, of course it was, I had to struggle to retain that motto because they wanted to change the capital, they wanted to change the national anthem, People wanted to change a lot a number of things. <laughs> and I said, no. The main reason why I didn't want to change was because if I had allowed them to change those things, they would have removed the word God from God. They would mm. have had another 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 motto. Mm. Uh, oh. So uh, uh, you can say uh, I, I, I liked and, and I said in a in a in a I think in a lecture or in a talk this this morning that I had wanted to start the constitution the preamble in the name of the Almighty God. That that that's, that's that, that, that was the first uh, manner in which the first sentence I wanted to put in the in the in the, in the, in the constitution. Uh, but as I advise that, I should keep God out of the Constitution. Because the Constitution is not for, uh, it's not a religious document. It's a political document. And uh, if you start invoking God as you write in the Constitution, uh, it will mean that you are going to write a very religious uh, a Bible. Now, I didn't agree with them, but we had to agree, compromise. Uh, and I, I thought that a constitution which does not have any reference to God would, 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 would be extremely dangerous. Uh, because Uganda, Uganda is a Christian country, basically. It's a religious country. Where over 80% uh, are Christians. Uh, and so, to, to try and change the motto, which I think was wisely chosen for God and my country, God first, country second, mm. was very important. Uh, uh, and of course, we entrench freedom of, of, of worship, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, uh, to practice your religion and so on. Um, uh, and so I think that uh, in a way, uh, subconsciously, we, 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 our, our, our decisions are affect, affected by our morals, our religious faith. Uh, it may not be so obvious, mm. but eventually, because that's what, that, that's what informs you. That's what you are. If you're a Christian, you're a Christian, finished. Your <laughs> values are there. And uh, you may not necessarily um, tell everybody how you, how you made the decision, what values you take into account, and so on. So, but let me tell you this. <laughs> we saw the oath to be to do justice to all manner of people mm -hmm. without fear of favor, affection, or ill will. Mm -hmm. The independent the oath of judicial oath, impartiality. And therefore, when you, are, when, you, when you are listening, when you are hearing a case, you must not, I don't put my personal faith or my beliefs first. 
It is the interest of those people who are coming before us, whom we serve. Justice is not for the judges, justice is for the people. If the people feel justice in their own way, I give it to them. I don't impose my views on anybody. And so, uh, whereas I don't agree with certain things, I will tell you one. And, it, and please don't quote me, because <laughs> we just had a decision. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but I will tell you, uh, I'm an abolitionist in terms of death penalty. I'm a human rest, uh, I believe, uh, in the sanctity of life. Uh, but uh, that is between me and you. <laughs> uh, the majority of Ugandans, and I wrote that constitution and put the provision there allowing for death penalty in the constitution because that's what the, majority, the people wanted. I could not impose my own views. I think we're in a minority in Uganda. Uh, and not everybody here would agree with me and so on, and I, I don't mind about that. Uh, my views are known by other judges. But we had a case, recently we had a case telling the constitutionality of death penalty. A woman called Susan Kigura and for 417 others who had been on death row for many years without being executed, brought a petition in the Constitutional Court to, petition, to challenge the constitutionality of death penalty. That's, it, is, it, is, it is contrary to the Constitution. It amounts to torture, uh, cruel, and degrading uh, human treatment or punishment. So we decided that case, um, hardly a year ago, what was I said, what was I what, how, what, what, what was I said to decide? I do it in the Constitution. I know what the Constitution says. <laughs> 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 there was, had been a constitutional review. People had said, no, you cannot remove the, the death penalty. So I could not offend the Constitution. Mm. Despite my personal view, it's not religious. That, that's not a religious view. It's a personal view. Uh, of, of, of the way I look at uh, human rights. So, uh, we decided that the, the death penalty is constitutional. It's lawful. It's permitted by the Constitution, which is the, which is the supreme law of the country. And which the judges don't have to change unless it is vague. But we modified the decision. We said a judge must have discretion to decide whether to impose that sentence. It, it, cannot, be, it cannot be mandatory. Mm. The law cannot say this, 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 judgment, this, this, this the death penalty must be passed in the case of murder, prison, or robbery. So to that extent, we modified that law. We modified the law and not the Constitution. The Constitution permitted death penalty. But the laws were saying that if you, are, if, you are, if you are convicted of murder, treason, robbery, etc., you must suffer death. You must suffer death. And I know I have, I have passed the sentence myself as a high court judge. And I've confirmed men on, on, on the Supreme Court. So, in a sense, we actually. Uh, wrote a very good compromise and in a sense the death penalty is not going to be imposed in many cases. Secondly, we said that uh, uh, the death row syndrome, people should not stay on the death row for a very long time. You cannot be on death row for 30 years waiting to be executed. We said government must decide within three years whether to execute or to commit a sentence. And if the government does not decide within three months, the death sentence will be committed automatically. Three years, right? Three years. Yes. It will be committed automatically to life imprisonment. Very revolutionary decisions. Of course, we are criticized that we are becoming lawmakers. <laughs> <laughs> then there was this question. They say the death penalty Carrying out the death penalty by hanging is cruel and degrading and inhuman. And what did we say? I believe all of you will say yes. But we said now, 
once you return the death penalty, whatever sentence you are going to impose will come to the same thing. So that, that is a, a no question. Mm. You said it is automatically that once you kill anybody by whatever means, it is cruel. Mm. So once the once, one, so we said it is not is 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 permissible by the constitution. The constitution has allowed it because it is provided for it. Mm. That was a controversial provision. Of course, here yeah, you did it differently. But we recommended that death pen, government should review. Government should review the death penalty and the manner of execution. So we did not do it ourselves, so we made a recommendation. So, so my religious feelings, my views, you cannot see them. If you come before me, I treat you as you are, equally. I will not put in my views. They don't come in my decisions mainly, they come in my conduct, my outlook to life, my behavior, my personality, which, as I told you, has got a lot of influence on decisions. That was the most interesting part of the Kagula opinion to me was the, the, the end where you said, we encourage the legislature to, to, yes. to look at the death penalty and no one is being executed and do we really, should we re-examine whether or not the death penalty is something that's appropriate for Uganda? I thought that was, that was uh, judges being judges and uh, encouraging the legislature to be legislature. I thought that was great. Well, we're nearing the end of our conversation. I have, uh, we, could, we could be here until midnight, which I would be happy with because I'm uh, uh, thoroughly enjoying this and I would love to be able to ask all of these wonderful questions that have been submitted and apologies uh, for the ones that I was not able to get to. But I wonder if Nicole might have one more question that, uh, that we could ask, and then uh, I'll have a, a word of wrap-up, and uh, I'll turn it back over to Dean Bost. Nicole, a, a, a great question. Okay. <laughs> no, um, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Um, all right. Uh, I guess you've already talked about some of your important decisions, and um, Pepperdine obviously has a, a very strong relationship now with the Ugandan judiciary. Uh, I really enjoyed working there, and I know uh, all of my colleagues have enjoyed working for the various judges in Uganda. And um, I was kind of wondering, now that we have this relationship, maybe how can we go forward so that Pepperdine, both the students and faculty, can cont continue to help the Ugandan judiciary, um, and how would we be mo most useful, and how do you feel about our relationship overall? Uh, the relationship is wonderful, and uh, <laughs> maybe as a beneficial, mutually beneficial, mm -hmm. and reinforcing. Um, I think uh, um, uh, maybe you have benefited more than uh, than Pepperdine. Uh, we took this, we took these students or this uh, law student or whatever you call yourselves, uh, <laughs> uh, young, young men and women. We accepted them uh, because we valued. We valued their service. Mm. Let me be frank. <laughs> uh, you know, in Uganda, in Uganda, judges don't have law clerks. They don't have uh, judicial. They don't have uh, uh, assistants. They do the work themselves. They do the research. They write opinions, and they deliver the opinions. Judges, they don't have. And so we had been debating the issue of. Uh, um, uh, whether we should have law clerks and which were this category and so on. Then suddenly we had this uh, uh, interaction, this conversation with the people from Pepperdine, Rob Goff and so on, with that conference. <laughs> but I said, but these are not lawyers. These are just students. How can they come to Uganda? For what? <laughs> we, we, need, we need lawyers who, are, who have gone through the course and they've got to write opinions and discuss <laughs> with the judge. But what have they come to do? Uh, but I said, no, this, let us have a look at the students first. Let us give them a chance. We need them, but let us see what they need, for, if, they, if they need us. Mm. And when they came, we found that they needed us and, 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 and we needed them. Mm. They were learning from Uganda mm. and we were learning from them. We, give, we gave them research projects, I mean, uh, when you ask the uh, uh, a student like in court to, to research for me on a case, she would use other comparative material. So there was comparative research, comparative review of authorities and so on. 
Uh, we also came to learn uh, cross-cultural exchanges, how the, the American people live and how they study and what are their expectations and so on. What do they think about us wearing wigs and, <laughs> and, and suits and uh, not allowing people to, to be shabby when they appear before the judges. What they see about is formality and so on. And they all molded themselves as if they were Ugandan lawyers. <laughs> this is a true story. And uh, of course, we discussed all these things about changes, reforming the system, computerization, uh, research capacity, uh, certain doctrines and issues, and so on. So, so, so there was a, a development of jurisprudence, uh, mm -hmm. a, a contribution to, to the role of Uganda jurisprudence, informed by other jurisprudence. This is what this is the, the, the conversation which has gone on, and so we so we value the students because they have provided a service which is lacking. I'm, I'm, going, I'm just going to be frank with you. They have provided a service where it is needed mm. and still needed. Mm. But we have discussed going beyond the nature of the service. That's why you find people now they're carrying out mediation. Mm. We have, uh, we're going to carry out other projects, for instance, uh, uh, I think they wanted to carry out a project on court recording. Mm. Uh, we want them to carry out a project on uh, even plea bargaining, mm. sentencing guidelines. We want them to be able to have linkages with here, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with American uh, scholars and courts, so that we can improve the legal system in Uganda. What has started us just researching for individual judges must be seen by the whole judiciary and by the people of Uganda. Mm. That is the, that's the vision. That that cooperation just not be within the chambers of the judges. It must go beyond and must inform our, 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 our vision for reform, our reform endeavors, and they must improve effectiveness of justice. Like a carrying out mediation, mm. actually doing work, physical work. Mm. Uh, the, I didn't know you had this powerful organization here, International what? We call it Global what? Justice Mission? Justice, is it International mm -hmm. Justice Mission? We, uh, Global Justice uh, Program. Yeah, and so on. Uh, <laughs> uh, it has got so many opportunities. Uh, uh, I'm amazed how you have all this stuff and all these uh, programs here. Uh, I think we have a lot of opportunity to co cooperate with, the, with Pepperdine and to improve, to refine and improve the programs and to continue collaboration. Uh, and, and I think that uh, so far, from what I've seen, I'm highly impressed. And when I leave, it's not, it will be a few, a few years, I'm going to recommend that this program must not be, must not be uh, scrapped. Mm. It must continue, and it must be strengthened. Mm. And I'm going, I'm going to make sure it is strengthened. So we're going to be discussing these issues of uh, developing other programs like uh, pre-bargaining, sentencing guidelines, children, I think program relating to juvenile justice, mm. access to justice. Uh, children are vulnerable, and we, have a, we want to make sure that it's, they are normally forgotten. Mm. Many of them are rotting in prisons, mm. uh, and so on. And, uh, and I think that... Uh, the work being done by Professor Ghosh and his, 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 his group is, is, is commendable, representing these uh, very vulnerable and disadvantaged people mm -hmm. who anybody can forget about. So we want to build this, uh, these programs within this student externship program. And uh, we do hope that uh, uh, the, 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 there will be a bigger pool uh, in the future to come uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and help us move the program forward. Well, thank you so much. We are so uh, grateful for the opportunity. I always tell uh, our friends in Uganda that we get way more out of this than, uh, th than you do, but uh, we're glad that it's <laughs> beneficial for you and that uh, uh, it's, it's been helpful. I thought I might conclude our, our conversation today with this. It's the last paragraph in uh, just Chief Justice Adoki's uh, book about uh, uh, the drafting of the Ugandan Constitution. He says this, Constitutionalism is a culture, a tradition which takes time to be firmly established. It has to be lived, nursed, and developed. 
It is through constitutionalism that Ugandans will realize their vision to build a new socioeconomic and political order based on the principles of unity, peace, equality, democracy, freedom, social justice, and progress. What a great vision. And uh, will you join me in expressing your appreciation to our guests? <laughs> well, I want to thank uh, Justice Odoki and our conversationalists for a very fascinating hour and 15 minutes. Uh, I think that this has been uh, wonderful. You know, uh, Justice Odoki made a, the comment in response to Kristen's good question. He said, when the, uh, when the American law clerks came over, we found out that they were learning from Uganda and we were learning from them. And that's the kind of collaboration that I think that uh, Justice Odoki has called us to. And one thing I learned today is not to take for granted the blessings of consti the constitutional rule of law. And it's just not an accident. It just doesn't drop from the sky. It is when men and women come together, cooperating, giving up, compromising, and coming together with, with a document and a set of documents, rules, laws, and which they can live under in peace and harmony. And this recent experience in Uganda led by Justice Odoki is, uh, is a great inspiration to me and a reminder, once again, not to take for granted what we have enjoyed in this country for a number of years. So God bless Uganda. God bless the United States. Thank you all for being here. We do have refreshments outside, and you'll have a chance to meet Justice Odoki and Justice Kay and uh, Samuel, our, our distinguished uh, guests from uh, Uganda. Thank you for being here. We're dismissed. Uh, that was marvelous.